Marie Wilde. This is the part two um, talk on types of meditation that I recommend. And I think I'm going to title this more something to the effect of how different types of meditation affect your mental and physical health. Because I think that um, some of this knowledge will help you decide if you are a beginner meditator or even if you're like a medium meditator like me, uh, who's maybe interested in diversifying your practice, um, maybe there's something in here that will uh, be interesting for you. Um, and again, I apologize for not being on camera this week. I, I bought a new camera, so we have higher quality stuff, and I just needed a makeup break and a little bit of time to kind of troubleshoot stuff like that. So hopefully uh, you can like just fold some laundry and enjoy some nature scenery. <laughs> um, and I'll probably do this once in a while because one of the barriers for me as a YouTube creator is... Um, there's something about being on camera that makes it a lot more stressful, so I'll do this from time to time if I have a deadline and something to get off my chest that I still think is important. Uh, so going into the three types of meditation I want to talk about today, I mentioned in the intro podcast to this one that two of the meditation types um, have a lot of research behind them one more than the other in particular, and then there is a third type that I want to start with today that I'd say, um, I, I have to admit I haven't like dug around the research in the last decade or so in a very heavy way, but I will say um, this third type is not very well researched, and I'll explain why, because it's kind of difficult to research, but I still want to mention it anyway because I think it's fascinating and I think it's a gap area for um, where our research could lie. Um, as a mental health advocate, I want to say that part of my inspiration for creating this content in particular is giving you tools to almost use meditation tentatively in um, like a self-help way that is targeted for your individual needs. We all have different mental health and physical health struggles that are very unique to our personal life experience. Um, obviously, I'm not a medical like doctor, so you know, please include your like PCP, your um, primary care provider, and you know your therapist and like your other practitioner people in a conversation if you decide to try some of this. Um, especially this first one that I want to go over because it's again, it, it, there's very little research, but um, I should say like very little like modern mainstream Western research. Uh, so that first meditation practice that um, I want to lead with just for fun for my own entertainment because the other ones are like a little bit more well-known is uh, Kundalini meditation. Kundalini yoga and meditation come from India. These practices I believe are about 4,000 years old. It's some of the oldest uh, spiritual it's both spiritual from their cultural perspective as well as like a physical art and like a mental health, mental physical health tool, I would say, or um, way of relating. This also ties into uh, medicinal things like Ayurveda. I think a lot of times in these like Eastern cultural like arts, I, I've seen like kind of that pattern of things like acupuncture, energy centers, uh, chakra centers, and herbalism, and it's kind of bittersweet because I feel like politically, I just want to say that this stuff has so much um, more potential than I think the Western world is acknowledging that, you know, there's often this idea that because there's little research in it, there's little value in it, um, and, you know, and that it's just like mystical thinking or something but it's not <laughs> like what's really fascinating about a lot of this stuff is like, especially like herbalism and energy centers and alternative medicine is when we do get to researching it like very often this wisdom that's thousands of years old that is passed down generationally through people's ancestral lineage is um very helpful so I'm very into like traditional medicine and herbalism in that sense too, which is kind of like another story for another day. But I feel that way about kundalini where it's very complicated. You know, there's kundalini yoga positions that are meant to help you with a myriad of different things. And I want to share that with people as a mental health advocate because 
there are literally like kundalini yoga you can do to help with addiction recovery. There's kundalini yoga you can do to help with feeling brokenhearted. Kundalini yoga that can help you with anger management issues or sleep problems. So like because it's a many thousands of year old tradition that I would say it, it holds like a wealth of knowledge from a culture that went very deep into their own ways of researching for thousands of years. I feel like focusing on the energy centers of the body, focusing on very specific, like regimented types of breath work and body positioning, the idea that there would be associations for some in the West, we might say, oh, well, that sounds really like magical thinking and woo woo and weird. But again, like this is thousands of year old knowledge it's worth a shot. You know, you know, if you are in addiction recovery and nothing else has worked, try, try it. Like it can't hurt. There are a lot of really cool YouTubers out there that I have uh, dabbled in and checked out who are Kundalini yoga teachers. I think a lot of yoga teachers are not from India. And I just want to point that out that there is a difference in quality. You, you know, we've all played the game of telephone, and I used this as an analogy uh, with my spouse the other day with respect to explaining things from my native culture. That, like, just because a native person tells you something doesn't necessarily mean that you are free to go teach what they told you, because the game of telephone could inadvertently change the original meaning, right? Um, and it's like nothing personal. It's just like the reality. So I, I do think it's important while it's beautiful, there's all these resources for Kundalini. And I'm not saying that you can't be a yoga, a good yoga teacher without um, being from India or being Indian. I do think that like there is a difference in quality of like primary versus secondary sources that a good student might want to be hyper aware of and you know, maybe guide themselves through a myriad of teachers or possibly focus on teachers that you feel are closer to like a cultural source. Um, there's this term, <laughs> I just, for some reason, it popped into my head, like we need to talk about called like being a culture vulture. Um, and I have heard people criticize like when white folks, I didn't mean to get this political, but I just feel like I need to say it because I think that there's a lot of people who want to be respectful that are averse to learning spiritual practices from other cultures or, being too thoughtful about like the primary secondary source thing that I've described. Um, I just, there's a lot of baggage out there about that. You know, we're as a people trying to grow and like become unified ideally and um, treat each other with respect. Um, these are, you know, yoga and Kundalini to my knowledge as it is today. And if you're Indian and disagree or have other information and want to comment, I would love to hear your take on this, but I don't think it's considered like a closed practice or anything. Um, I think, you know, there were yoga teachers who came to the West who um, genuinely felt that like this is an art form that should be shared with the world. Um, but I also think, you know, like be careful not to like, I think it's good not to like fetishize it or get like aesthetically weird with it and I've been guilty of this myself you know I, th I think I have like mandalas and like you know jewelry type thing because I like that stuff you know the aesthetic is beautiful too but like just be careful that you're being respectful um I don't know if people like from these countries where these arts originate feel as passionate about that I think this is a very American conversation because in America we have like a lot of baggage with race a lot of multiculturalism but not without a lot of like trauma and, you know, continued discussions of things that are still not right. Yeah, like um, profiting off of the sale of another culture's knowledge, for example. So just, you know, be mindful of that. Like, I, I think I would be remiss to not mention this stuff is on my mind as well, that, like, I don't have all the answers for how to study in, in Hawaiian, we call it pono, like, in a righteous way that is, like, free of like negative weird baggage um but anyway I think that's enough like discussion about that I just felt like I would be missing a piece of the puzzle if I didn't give you that because there are people who avoid learning stuff like this because they don't want to overstep and as far as I know I think you would be more benefited by learning from this kind of stuff than not and um yeah it is weird it, I don't want to say it's weird but like a lot of kundalini yoga practices and positions are strange 
um, you know, they ask you to move your body and do things with your body in ways that like we don't typically think to. Um, you know, like the ways that you might fold your hands, if you fold them in a certain direction, you might reverse the direction in order to um, change your brain. And it can feel really bizarre. The other thing that's interesting about art forms like this is the way energy centers are kind of portrayed. You see this in acupuncture as well, where there are considered energy meridians in these practices that I just, again, I think they're is like this whole world of um, deeper research that we could be doing as a global society to lift up and validate this stuff. I really wish things like acupuncture and Chinese medicine were covered under our healthcare programs, for example. And a lot of times the excuses for why they are not is because of the lack of research. So let's do more research because I think this stuff is very powerful. And I mentioned Kundalini first because First of all, it's fun, and it's like something people have probably heard less about in our um, our cultural context. But secondly, because, again, like as a mental health advocate, I feel like Kundalini offers a lot of alternative modalities for targeting really specific ailments. And it also just helps you to think about your body and your mind connection in a really interesting kind of radical way. I personally have practiced this type of yoga or this type of meditation, and it's really life changing and really impactful. It's very strange, like some, and you know, some could say, "Well, you held your breath for so long. Of course, you were lightheaded." <laughs> like you know, and and that's if you're that skeptic, you know, again, like we should be doing more research on this. But like, I, I earnestly feel that like doing those types of meditation practices does have specific impacts on your mind body health and you know it really does almost feel like a medicinal prescription for like very specific ailments and I want people to be empowered to at least explore that you know I can't say that there's absolute scientific evidence for all of it that it always works um and I I do want to say too because of the lack of research I would also caution people to go slowly you know, something I've been taught in like more spiritual woo-woo communities with like radical meditation or like whatever juju stuff like that, like, you know, stay grounded. <laughs> like there all of these types of practices, especially like yoga and meditation, often there will be like visual practices of this thing called like grounding yourself and just kind of like putting your energy into the earth, so to speak, um, metaphorically, I'll say, or just... Um, staying grounded if you're less of a a, a spiritualist like woo-woo person just the consciousness of being grounded taking things slowly um the same yoga teacher i mentioned earlier in this podcast uh and granted they, they came from like kind of hard knock you know child abuse and neglect uh poverty drug culture like friends and family you know there was a little bit of that so we can't exclusively attribute it to their meditation practice but they did have a friend who supposedly they felt he had lost his mind because he was doing like a third eye like kundalini chakra meditation your third eye is the part between your two visual like physical eyes there's a belief that like the pineal gland which is a physical structure in the brain that produces all of our I don't know if it's all, but like a lot of our hormonal chemicals and like emotional, the pineal gland is very important. Um, you'll hear like hippies and conspiracy theorists talk about unblocking your pineal gland. I can't quite speak to that. I don't know if that's real, but I do know that the pineal gland is a physical structure in the brain that is incredibly important for all kinds of chemical functions. And um, the disruption of that in any kind of physical sense can be very damaging to one's mental health and the health of the pineal gland is very important from a scientific more scientifically researched and known physiological sense um what's really cool i think about like indian meditation and health systems and the chakra system is that the like seven main chakras and a lot of the other meridians that are a little bit sim similar to like acupuncture and acupressure points is um I'm losing my train of thought with that a little bit. I'm nervous people will be like resistant to learning this stuff because it sounds too out there. Let's get back to that story about 
the pineal gland and this person who was meditating very forcibly on their pineal gland and they were doing so without incorporating the other seven chakras so in the kundalini like hindu chakra chakra system i think it's pronounced ch chakra like chak um probably different maybe I, like i might not even have the right muscles in my mouth to pronounce it perfect but um there's seven main ones and then there are like hundreds of other meridian ones that you know like if you look at japanese acupuncture japan and india are both in asia and some of these systems are a little bit similar to each other just like languages might be a little bit have like similarities um so there's these energy meridians right and what's cool about the seven chakras in Hindu systems is they correlate very well with our physical organs and like electromagnetic centers of the physical body. So, you know, I just I think this stuff is really ripe for like deeper exploration and validating research. Um, I, I frankly, I, I think it's it's probably like a little bit rooted in like possibly racism or ethnocentrism that we don't explore these um, ancient health tools more thoroughly and validate them globally. Uh, but for now, you know, the chakra system is considered like quite woo. So I tell these stories, I, I know that like, even though that stuff's not necessarily considered valid in mainstream society or like in mainstream science, um, people are still interested in it and people are still open to learning about it. So for those of you who are not worried about like the skeptic side of it, I will say that like my meditation yoga teacher mentioned the importance of like not jumping in too deep with certain types of Kundalini meditation because like it is a type of medicinal energetic work, right? So like if you're doing it in a haphazard or reckless way, just like anything you could have for lack of a better term, kind of like an energetic OD on certain things. So that that's like the one warning with that is like, some might say this isn't for beginners. Um, I would just say take it slow, you know, and be very mindful of like how you feel, like check in with your body, be very self-aware and self-guided in that process. And like, don't go like bite off more than you can chew. Start very small and just pay attention to the energetic changes in your body and remain grounded as well as like if you're choosing to do these more like out there meditation practices focus on the ones that ground you especially as a beginner so for example with the guy who had this supposedly like overactivated third eye who had a for lack of a better term like a psychotic meltdown over it or you know a mental health crisis um the the reigning like explanation I've heard in this particular community is that he was not grounded, that you need to ground your root chakra, you need to ground all of the chakras that are like in the lower physical part of the body. Oftentimes when Western people get interested in this stuff, there I feel like there's almost this like hyper individualist capitalist uh, hunger for like I'm gonna be enlightened now <laughs> like and I don't mean to offend anybody I'm just being really frank like why I think this stuff happens more like when western people are like learning this is like we are so used to instant results we're so used to like click and ship delivery and oh I'm just gonna pop a pill for my anxiety and have a cup of coffee when I'm sleep deprived like we have a lot of like quick fix kind of energy I think in our culture and I do feel like sometimes with these more I'm gonna say like powerful or targeted forms of meditation like yeah there is a risk especially to western people who don't have certain types of guidance or who are like trying to jump the gun and I really think that it's very related to wanting to be like psychic or enlightened <laughs> like like in kundalini yoga in like certain like ancient beliefs like there's stories of like people being able to levitate they've learned to meditate so hard that they their bodies are floating i can't believe i'm telling you guys this because we're just we're getting into the weird side of this stuff and i didn't mean to but i can't help it because it's funny um and i kind of believe it's possible right but it's like that jackie chan movie stuff where like you know your martial arts and your meditation and your chi is just like so off the charts that you're levitating or you have developed like almost supernatural powers um I've been watching X-Files lately with my spouse and like there's a couple episodes like that right where like 
some X-Files are created by, like, people just having very good meditation skills. I don't really know, like, I don't think those things happen enough where that should ever be the reason anybody is going after it. I just, you know, anybody who's good at that stuff knows, like, it's really much more mundane and it's meant to be mundane. And, you know, if you are born in a monastery from age two, incarnated as somebody and like meditated your whole 70 to 120 years lifetime and are like just isolated in the hills and start levitating because you've meditated for like a billion hours. Cool. Like, I'm sure I don't think that that's impossible actually, (laughs) but for those of us who are just trying to get our 20 minutes in every morning so we can drive to work in slam bad traffic without panicking, I think that's really what like most meditation is about but kundalini I think is kind of a fun in-between where like if you wanted to experiment with these more like I want to say deeper arts like I, I do think some of them are older I think they're some of the oldest forms of this like mind-body connection art form and uh it's just fascinating and I just think there's a lot of knowledge there that's valid and important and interesting and might help you, you know, and I'm not an expert in this by any means. I'm just like a little messenger showing you like a Karen on a hiking trail that I've heard is very cool that I've taken a few steps on myself. Um, so that's Kundalini. You can find teachers on YouTube. Um, I studied like little bits and pieces of Kundalini from teachers on YouTube and it really positively impacted my life. Um, again, go slow and like go with your gut with like who you're seeing. And if you are one of those people who's like very mystically, magically minded, the kind of person who like wants to be like the Jackie Chan martial arts, you know, you know, if you're interested in like magic and like brain, supernatural brain stuff, um, I would just like give you the warning that therein lies that kind of stuff in that world. But always stay grounded and, you know, be questioning of, I want to call it like the commodification or like the fetishization of religious superiority, I think is like the best way to frame this is like, I think guys like who lose their minds in these arenas um, or who become like ungrounded and energetically unbalanced because they took the wrong medicine or they took the wrong medicine at the wrong dose, so to speak, um, Usually it seems like it's a result of like hyper speeding too quickly, you know, like wanting to be enlightened in an exponential way instead of just like letting things unfold naturally. That's a really specific (laughs) piece of advice that like is not going to apply to a majority of you. Um, But I feel like it's important to share it with somebody. If you are interested in more of what I'm talking about with respect to that, another interesting psychologist you might want to check out is the Groff couple, like Stanley and his wife, G-R-O-F. They, uh, it's a co- a married couple that wrote a book together on spiritual crisis. And I think that like being mindful of people who are seeking spirituality and people who are deep in spiritual practices, uh, from a mental health, like advocacy and healing standpoint, I, I think studying the Groff's work on spiritual crisis is interesting and and possibly valid for a lot of people and might protect you or might help to illuminate um, situations you or your loved ones have been in before. So I won't go too deep into that, but I I just wanted to intro with like Kundalini is interesting and I recommend it. So that's our first one. And already we're, we're kind of like halfway through the podcast in terms of time. The other two, I will speak less about, I think in the sense that like, there's so much research out there for them. Um, so the other two types of meditation that I have tried and that I recommend are Zazen, um, also known as by some as mindfulness meditation. And we'll go into that a little bit. And Maitri, then I'll talk about last. Um, so Zazen meditation, it's called, it, there's many different words for Zazen. I know it as Zazen because I was taught in Japanese style temples. Um, Japanese Buddhism, Zen Buddhism was brought over. There's like the Diamond Sangha. Um, there's also Tibetan Buddhism that came to the United States from Troyang Trumpa Rinpoche. I'm probably saying his name sloppily. 
um, who is the founder of my alma mater, Naropa University. So the Eastern teachers who came to the United States with their versions of mindfulness meditation, I would say, like, I, I can't confirm this totally, like, I'm not a historian, but I'm pretty sure that, like, mindfulness and or zazen, whatever culture you whatever name you have for it, probably exists in multiple cultures all throughout the East. And, you know, they have different languages for this. So like there's different words for it. My, I have to admit that like my meditation teacher at a Japanese Buddhist temple that I studied at for a little bit, I don't know if studied the right, I sat at, we sat together in Hati and meditated. Um, They didn't think that mindfulness meditation was the same as Zazen. But I kind of felt like that was more like a language barrier that like obviously Zazen to those of us who are like deeply studying it and especially those who have Japanese heritage, it's going to have more nuance and it's going to have more meaning to us. But um, as far as like the way people are taught to meditate under these structures, it's the same. So I'll just teach you right now because it's very easy. It's not like Kundalini where there's all these different types. Um, Zazen meditation or mindfulness meditation, from what I understand, it's just the process of slowing your thoughts down and like letting them go. And so this is the absolute most common form of meditation that we have access to in the West. And I want to talk about it from that framework because there are problems, I don't want to like disrespect, but I think that there are problems for Western people with respect to this. Asian cultures and countries are typically very collectivist. So in Zazen meditation, the idea is that you are reaching enlightenment for yourself as an individual, and your meditation practice is individually yours, and it's it's very like individualized. And that's very healthy for a collectivist society. You know what I'm saying? Like in terms of the balance, um, if you come from a very collectivist society where uh, conformity and like collaboration and cooperation is more important than standing out um, or competition then in your spiritual practice like in your quest for enlightenment I think it makes sense that you would be turning that flashlight inward to like know yourself right and to claim your spirituality from an individual place that said, um, in the West, again, I think that there is some risk hazards with that, where uh, I'll just tell you right now that there have been uh, cognition research research on people who meditate, and something that they found that I think is really interesting that you will not hear people talk about, because overall I would say mindfulness or zazen meditation, whatever you want to call it, is a healthy thing I would say like between the binary of like healthy not healthy obviously it's healthier to do it than not but they did find that people who specifically did that kind of meditation only that kind of meditation and a lot of it were more prone to um I don't want to say sociopathic tendencies but because you're training your mind to kind of ignore stressors or not um, make uh, a stressful stimuli, like a, a stressful perceptive stimuli, more meaning than it needs to have. It, it's hard to explain, but it leads people to have less compassion, essentially, in certain cases. So Zaza meditation or mindfulness meditation, who is it good for? It's really, really good for people who have a lot of anxiety, a lot of rushing thoughts. Um, I think it's good for people with ADHD um, or difficulty concentrating and focusing. It's diff it's good for people who have a hard time with sensory overload, who get panic attacks from stuff like that, because what it does is it helps you to slow down all of that input, all of those thoughts, and not um, allow them to spiral, right? Like often when we're ruminating, you know, you think like, like say you go through a bad breakup and you're thinking about your ex and your heartache. And then you think, oh, I got to stop thinking about them. And then because you're being upset at yourself for thinking about them, you'll start thinking about, oh, yeah, I, I, well, I just can't stop because I'm such a loser. What's wrong with me? And then you'll just start thinking more and more and more <laughs> like as a result of your resistance. So that's why, like, when you hear these types of meditation practices, they're like, just let your thoughts flow like a river. 
every thought passes and it is just a leaf on a stream and that thought doesn't mean anything and you're not your thoughts and that's just a thought and another one and they'll come and go and you just let them go. And when you do that to your brain, it is really healthy because a lot of us just have too much going on all at once, like those multiple screens we might be playing on that I talked about in the intro to this, the first part. Um, yeah, it's great. It's great to like slow down the thousand voices and just to give your brain that um, fortification, that ability to reset and that practice in focusing on one thing at a time and letting things not mean more than what they are, right? But as a result of that, you're also training your mind to be less reactive to stressful stimuli at its core point, which is, again, pretty healthy for a lot of people. But in the West, I want to say, like, for example, there are just, like, deficits of compassion in certain areas of our culture. For example, our homelessness epidemic. We've got more food and housing than homeless and starving people. And the fact that, and, and this is like, again, like kind of political, but like, you know, basically like we live in a society that um, some people would consider uncivilized because we don't care for all of our poor. We don't care for all of our elderly or all of our children as much as we could be. Um, we're one of the, in America, I'm recording this in the United States, we're one of the richest countries in the world with some of the highest poverty rates and that's just statistics right so we're very used to um for example seeing a homeless person on the street who's panhandling and looking away and not wanting to think about them right and i think that well i don't think like this was proven by some research into the impacts of mindfulness meditation and the fact that at an extreme and in our cultural context in the american context being very good at zaza and, and I don't again I don't want to offend anybody because for some of us it's like a spiritual thing and I have a lot of spiritual reverence in particular for zaza and so I think actually I'm not even going to attach it to the Japanese version of that that I learned like I'll just call it mindfulness meditation right like mindfulness meditation or no thought meditation or just focus on your breath meditation it's super healthy overall however it doesn't make you a more compassionate person and in fact, in certain cases, there has been some data and research that has shown that people who do this kind of meditation a lot, they actually feel less sometimes. They may have less empathy for others in certain instances. Now, in some instances, I think a lot of us are so stressed out, so burnt out, so overstimulated, so freaked out that like we are meaner than somebody who's good at any type of meditation, including and especially mindfulness or zazen, right? Like, there's been times when I'm so awful and stressed out and, like, you know, maybe you were, like, a little bit short with the barista, you know, if they got your order wrong or something. I hate admitting that, like, but, like, when you see videos of, like, Karen people or, like, people doing road rage or being weird in public and, like, hostile, it's really obvious to me that, like, this is somebody who's very, very stressed out, right? And zazen meditation can help you to heal that. In fact, I would say it is the cure for a majority of us. Like, it will mellow out your stress. You know, it will make you a less stressed out person. It will make you a less reactive person. And as a result of that, I would say for most people, like, becoming a meditator is going to make you a nicer person to be around because you're not going to freak out as much over like petty inconveniences or like traffic jams or if somebody's rude to you like you're not going to take it as personal because you're so used to like letting life flow a little bit more that like it just doesn't affect you anymore but I do want to say that the reason we're going to talk about the third kind of meditation that I also recommend is for some of us, and especially people in our culture that's so individualistic, that has a lot of, frankly, cruel things going on, like, interpersonally. Like, we are not the most moral or ethical society that ever was, right, guys? Like, we, I think we have a lot of social work to do to lift up people who are struggling and to be more unified as a people and take better care of each other, frankly. Like, you know, it's not a perfect world. And just as much as these kinds of meditations can help you ignore stressful, bad stuff. I think it, you know, the research kind of suggests it can also help you ignore stuff that maybe you shouldn't ignore. You know, um, it can 
have an effect of making you a little bit more like, I want to say blasé or casual about like misfortune sometimes of others like only not only your own misfortunes are not that big a deal like oh man like I I didn't get my dream job or oh my favorite pants got stained right <laughs> and I have to throw them away if you're a meditator in this type of meditation that stuff's not going to matter that much it's not going to bother you as much as normal because you've trained your mind to be less reactive but in the same breath you know if there's a burning building and like you need to go save like a kid or a puppy out of the burning building your brain like the stress response of your brain isn't there as much and like thinking of something as a big deal um i had read some of this research kind of suggested that this type of meditation could also have that negative impact i don't think this applies to people from collectivist cultures frankly and i want to be really clear in that i don't want to imply that you know um Japanese Zazen Buddhism practices like you know that, that that has any kind of like negative thing for their culture I think it's more like a thing for western people again like learning these art forms and I didn't really mean for this talk to be about the pitfalls of being a western student in eastern meditation practices but I guess I, I guess I'm just having to mention it because it'd be irresponsible not to I think um and that's just what's needing to be said right now but yeah, like, basically, like, if you are the kind of person who, like, doesn't donate to charity, like, doesn't break for a pigeon on the sidewalk, or, like, you know, doesn't want to caretake your elderly parents or grandparents, like, eat, like, be aware that, like, these types of meditation practices, like, they might be impacting that potentially for some people in the West who are studying this stuff who don't really live in a culture that's as collectivist and that could impact our capacity for compassion for other people in certain um, contexts. So I'll go ahead and link that research because it is kind of like odd. And again, like it is not to imply that like people in other cultures where this is more of a practice, like have those same issues. I think it might be like unique to us as like beginners um, culturally or something like that. I don't, I don't really know how to like phrase that. Uh, in a PC way, but it does concern me, I think, as somebody that believes in compassion and, you know, wants, um, I want my meditation practice and I want yours to be healthy. And so that said, I want to go into the final meditation practice. And then actually, like, we might talk a little bit about like positive thinking as well, because I think it's related. But like, one of the things about Zazen and mindfulness, getting back to that, the most common one you'll ever be exposed to, I, I would say, in our world, in our Western like context, is um, it doesn't like help you to be like I would say like Dharma talks and Buddhism, they can help you to think more positively, but the process of zazen of like sitting meditation itself for mindfulness, kind of like tools, that tool of like no thought, just focus on the breath. I don't feel like it necessarily is as, as effective as deliberately reprogramming your mind if you have a mind that has like a lot of negative recurring thoughts. So for example, um, no thought meditation, mindfulness, zazen, whatever you want to call it, like if you are somebody who is like neither pessimistic nor optimistic, if you're somebody that like had a pretty average upbringing, if you're somebody who's recurring thoughts are like not that negative, like maybe you have racing thoughts because you watch a lot of TV and play on social media a lot and are overstimulated, but they're not necessarily negative racing thoughts, right? That's another like situation where I think that this kind of like very neutral meditation practice would be very helpful for you. But I also want to throw in the caveat that like if you have like any kind of negative recurring thoughts that are particularly dark, you know, or um, if you are an abuse survivor, especially that's like the example I really want to give here is like if you suffered a lot of child abuse and neglect or some of your self-talk is is difficult, you know, is like hateful or self-harming. Um, I also don't necessarily think that you should exclusively do Zazen meditation for the reason that, you know, I feel like the healing process would be slower. I feel like there are other types of meditation 
especially the one I'm going to talk about next, that needs to be brought in in balance. I think Zazen, mindfulness meditation, the no thought, like just focus on your breath technique is ideal for people who have just too many thoughts in their mind and too much going on and too much noise, you know, too many stressors and chaos. But again, it, it, it's inherently coming from a place of neutrality. So those are like the two negatives to that is that I think it can help you ignore negative things going on in your environment in a way that might dampen your compassion or your sense of urgency to help people and to fight for them. And it can also slow down other processes that somebody with a lot of negative programming from types of abuse they may have suffered at the hands of others um, or epigenetic trauma intergenerational trauma that has been passed down and you know self-esteem issues that may have came from being a descendant of oppressed people or um, being hurt by your parents as a child those kinds of brain health issues I think in certain ways obviously if you're dealing with that like going to therapy and you know considering like other more common you know medical industry tools for addressing that kind of stuff sometimes like pharmaceutical intervention or herbal stuff or you know just talk therapy or other types of like clinical therapy are important for you as well um but that's kind of where i wanted to get into maitri meditation is like maitri is loving kindness meditation it it's also coming from i think like buddhist origins and eastern origins and i feel like my tree is the second most common that I've seen a lot of like like my tree and Kundalini come up right like if you're like into meditation like all, all of those different types will be around but um my tree is the process of it's like a self-love meditation and it it's interesting like both are like I would say like kind of like Buddhist ideas of like you know, like no thought meditation, mindfulness meditation, you know, like letting things be as they are, like no resistance, that that kind of energy, like, you know, to be at peace with whatever is. And then for Maitri, it's about like loving yourself and having compassion for your fellow sentient beings and, you know, coming to your reality and cultivating a mind full of love. And I just want to say, like, for some of us, that is going to be a lot more powerfully healing. And for a lot of us, myself included, like you might want to try a combination of many of those. So like I have noticed if I'm doing a lot of Zazen meditation or mindfulness meditation or, you know, that type where I'm not thinking and I'm deliberately training my mind to like pay less attention to my own recurring thoughts, be they negative or positive. Um, I have noticed like the benefits and then the drawbacks again, right, of like being more calm, being less reactive, uh, feeling a deeper uh, internal locus of control with keeping my own personal peace versus um, also not really caring that much if like my loved one goes through a breakup or uh, I see somebody get hurt, the level of oh well, like that I might attribute to my own life struggles or stresses, <laughs> like like I still feel compassion, right, because I'm a hyper-compassionate person in a lot of cases, but like, you know, you are not as like, oh no, like, you know, for other people's misfortune either, so I feel like I've explained that a few times, it's like, it makes me nervous to talk about because I, I think that data could be misconstrued in an ugly way as well, but I, I still think it's worth mentioning. And I also think it's kind of interesting that this is the most well-researched, um, mindfulness meditation is the most well-researched and ubiquitous type of meditation in our culture. And part of me kind of wonders, like, is that a conspiracy? You know, like, why aren't we doing more my tree? Why isn't my tree more like, like, cause I, I, I'm like, well, would that cause a revolution? You know, if we were, training our minds towards love rather than neutrality if we were training our minds to love ourselves in a radical way to love other people in a radical way to love our enemies in a radical way that would create a much different kind of ripple effect in society potentially than just training ourselves not to be stressed out regardless of what the stimuli the stimuli or the news is right um and i think both again in balance are important both are helpful but my tree is really good for forgiveness 
my tree is really good if you are someone who has again like had a lot of negative self-talk or if you were verbally abused by caretakers or a domestic violence survivor any kind of survivor of abuse anyone who has um experienced suicidal ideation or a lot of like issues with hostility and rage i think like zazen meditation the one we were talking about the second one is good for healing things like anger management and stuff as well but my tree is the loving kindness meditation is really beautiful in that it makes you it, it just improves your relationships and it improves your capacity to have compassion and love for other people and granted like love is kind of an abstract idea too right like I don't think anybody really we all know what love is but I think we all also don't know what love is and the Greeks had like nine different types of names for love and some people really don't like the idea of love because it, you know it's like freedom or democracy or like anything else that's been um overused and maybe like had its meaning change throughout different contexts because it's considered such a pure value that eventually it almost becomes meaningless so so there's like you know pros and cons to everything right in that way but my tree basically focuses your mind on how to be loving to yourself and loving to other people and especially or not especially but also importantly loving to your difficult people in your life or people that you hate so i'll just give you a really brief maitri lesson if you want to start practicing this again i'm not like the best teacher there's other teachers out there but if you just wanted to only listen to this and then start today from maitri you start with yourself and you know you get into your meditative space you know you're sitting um or standing usually sitting like a typical meditation practice um and you just focus on self-love, you know, in that quietude. So a lot of those like recurring thoughts that might be in your mind, instead of just letting them float down the river, like we do in the second meditation I taught you, you might hold and be aware of some of those in a more loving, compassionate way, where maybe one of my recurring thoughts is, wow, I feel so ugly today. <laughs> I'm having a bad hair day. I gained some weight. Uh, I feel old. I have wrinkles. I don't think anyone will think I'm beautiful. Maybe that's one of my thoughts I'm holding on to. Or maybe I have a thought about a loved one that I got into an argument with recently, and that is a, a, a thorn. You know, maybe I feel very embarrassed about what I said, or um, why why didn't they love me enough to, or you know, treat me in the way that I wanted to be loved. Um, and so you know, you're kind of like dealing with those emotions in a more direct way where you are just meditating and focusing on first self-love because you got to start with you first. The next step after really filling your, there's two ways to do this. Um, and I recommend trying both. I think both are good. I think if you find this practice really hard, especially the second steps to it, um, start with doing them separately as separate meditations. But basically you are asked to put the love on yourself or cultivate the love for yourself. And then the next step or level is to put the love on your a loved one, uh, cultivate love for a loved one who is close to you. And then the next uh, ring around that is somebody who's like an acquaintance that you're neutral to. Put the love on them. Focus on cultivating love for someone who is, someone you feel neutral about either way. And then the fourth and most difficult category um, is to put the love, cultivate love for someone that you have bad blood with or hatred for or a really difficult time loving. And that fourth one, as we all know, <laughs> right away, it's like, ooh, like, and frankly, why I say like, try both, like you can either do all four in a single meditation where like maybe you sit for 20 minutes and the first like five or 10 minutes you focus on yourself and then the next few minutes, you know, you continue to focus on the other categories of relationship in your life with respect to the difficulty of loving through them, you know, <laughs> loving through neutral, you know, someone you already love, that's not too hard. Somebody that you're neutral to, not too hard. Somebody that you have anger for or bad blood with, that is going to be difficult and you know, some of my teachers have said, like, 
don't choose somebody that's too hard. You know, if you were like brutally, brutally abused by like a parent and thinking about them is too hard, don't start with that person. Start with somebody, you know, a politician or like start with someone that you have negativity towards, but it's like not that bad, you know, like that guy who cut you off in line yesterday or something, you know, someone that isn't quite as emotionally triggering. Because again, going back to my advice for Kundalini meditation, you don't need to go for broke. Like you don't need to meditate for three hours. You don't need to do the hardest meditation that's guaranteed to bring enlightenment. You don't need to become like the Buddha today or tomorrow, you know, although (laughs) fun aside, one of the most beautiful memories I have back when I got to meditate in a group more recently um, at Japanese temple, I was noticing one of the little old aunties that was walking with us and she was on that day. You know, like when you are meditating in a group once in a while, you'll like notice people, you know, some people who stand out because they're fidgeting and they look like they're stressed out that day and maybe a little distracting. Some people stand out because they're inspirationally still. And on this day, one of my, um, one of my community members was inspirationally still and had like this very beautiful energy. And then it happened to be a week where we would have like tea together and listen to Dharma talk afterwards. And she had, it was, you know, the table was open for comments and she had mentioned that what she was thinking about on that day in her meditation practice was the teaching that when we meditate, we become the Buddha. And for those of you who aren't religious, like, it's fine, like, take it or leave it. Like, you can, you can think of the Buddha as being more like an analogy for the deepest peace, right? If you don't want to attribute like a religious or um, leadership, whatever, like religious component to it. But for those of you who are inspired by stuff like that, I do think that's cool that like, while I can say, you know, you don't need to be enlightened today by starting this practice you can still be clumsy you can still be messy and and actually that's the best way to go about it is to practice it's a practice right like you're not there's no goal and it's better to do these things without any goal it's better to think of them more as like a day-to-day thing that is simple and easy and small and mundane I think in my personal experience um but I just thought that was so beautiful what she said that um when you meditate, you become the Buddha. When you meditate, you become the peace. The thing that we are aspirationally trying to get to, some of us, we have already reached it at the moment that we have, uh, like, I I guess, agreed to it in that moment. And then, you know, meditation's over and we'll go back to getting into petty disagreements with people or being mad that the bananas we bought got brown too fast or whatever. (laughs) You know, our petty little you know, ups and downs of life, right? But um, in that moment, she embodied enlightenment and I felt that in her. Like, I just felt like, wow, like you look very peaceful today and I am so proud of like, or I don't know if proud's the right word, but like enamored and excited by, and and heartened by seeing how calm her energy was in that space. And that was her meditation that was, I guess, putting her into that place of like, a lot of grace is embodying that. And if you were a Christian, you know, you might, um, you know, whatever religion you come from, maybe you have like a spiritual symbol or person that you look up to that will help you to also gain inspiration like that. So I thought I would just mention that as an aside that, you know, no, I don't think most of us who meditate become enlightened. <laughs> you know, like I think, you know, in a kind of way, like a lot of us who meditate, are just like very aware of how unenlightened we actually are and like what a funny concept that is and if you think of time as being non-linear and you think of like your meditation practice as like your break from being unenlightened that's kind of a cool way to frame it for yourself as well but um anyway going back to our third meditation uh style my tree loving kindness meditation i really really recommend this one to beginners, everybody, because we all have negative self-talk. A lot of us, we all come from a world that has a lot of conflict, has a lot of judgment, has a lot of war, a lot of jihad, a lot of judgment, a lot of spicy reality TV with people yelling at each other. And like, you know, just 
it can be a hostile world. And, and I feel like my tree in particular is a really soothing medicine for that. And it, it will help you with your self-esteem. It will help you to be a calmer, more self-loving person. And it will also help you to be kinder to your loved ones. And it will also help you to keep your cool when it comes to like enemies or people who, you know, maybe are not your favorite people in the world. Um, it, I think it helps keep you from snowballing like conflict too. Like say there's somebody at the office that you don't really get along with and, you know, maybe you don't practice meditation. And so you guys just snark at each other all year and it just gets out of hand and like worse, you know, she steals your pencil, you steal the candy off her desk or whatever it is, <laughs> like, you know, whatever tit for tat, you know, you took my promotion. I'm going to throw you under the bus for this, like that kind of energy. But if, if you're practicing my tree, you know, maybe you don't have to respond, right? Like you don't need to snowball a conflict because it can just stop with you, you know, cause you have that mental fortitude to be, um, a more loving, more understanding person. Now I don't mean be a doormat, of course, like, you know, and that's the other beauty of my tree is it's not like you love other people more than yourself. You always start with yourself. And I think that's really lovely too. Um, so those are the three meditation types that I know of that I can recommend. I do want to throw in a third or a fourth idea while we're talking about, I like to call it like training the mind. I think meditation is a form of brain training, just like exercise is a way to train your body. Meditation and mindfulness um, practices like being in nature or doing certain types of creative work or um, even kind of boring work sometimes that's just like meditative because it's so boring, <laughs> like uh, mindfulness practices in general that are not meditation, um, those things are meant to train the mind to be, usually to be neutral or more healthy in a certain kind of way. And I also think it's not, I don't know, like maybe some people in like the new age, more like modern eclectic community might consider positive thinking another type of brain training. But there are things that like, I don't, you know, I don't think these are like meditation practices per se, or like they haven't been like officiated by any like religious doctrine or anything like that, or like long-term thousands of year old practices. But gratitude meditations like on the more like colloquial like common mainstream new age front um things like visualizing your highest good people in sports psychology actually use that to help athletes like shoot the goal and that's something that I want to touch on and explore maybe in another episode like the merit of creative visualization because a lot of people think of it like the secret and the like affirmation um manifesting movement there's a lot of toxicity in that so like again it's a separate podcast I think but um I mention it because it reminds me a little bit of my tree in the sense of like cultivating what kind of thoughts you want to be having about yourself and others and the situations in your life so for example um I had a lot of like petty misfortunes befall me this month where you know my dryer broke down my car broke down I couldn't get to the gym because I didn't have a car and like I was pretty miserable I gotta admit like it took away my sauna time like all these things that I really like you know like clean clothes you know, not having to hang things on a clothesline. We, we had a weird bathroom set up with like a heater in the bathroom. It was crazy, guys. It was like so silly. And nothing was life or death, right? Like we had good food all week, you know, bills were paid overall, like repair guys came, we could afford our car repairs. So like there were all these blessings in the end, but like in the moment for the week that it happened, I got sick from stress. <laughs> so like I broke out in hives and I just couldn't sleep and I was like, this sucks. Like so bummed out you know um and then when it all got fixed all at once like a week or two later you know got the dryer back I was driving home from the gym and I just saw it and I was like wow I'm so grateful you know I'm just so grateful right now for stuff that I didn't even think about losing before right and that's kind of cheesy to say but I, I remember like having a, a bit of a conversation with God about it. And if you're not religious, by the way, like this isn't meant to be a religious station. Um, transpersonal psychology is a religious or a spiritual practice or a spiritual exploration of psychology. Um, but I, I just want to say like 
if I talk about God, I'm not trying to convert you. It's, this is just the way my mind works. And I think we should all respect that about each other. Um, but anyway, like I was kind of like wondering, I was like, Hey God, like, did you take away my car and my gym access and my laundry access? So I would be more grateful. <laughs> you know, like That was like one way I was sort of framing it. Like, hmm, like, because I'm very grateful now and I really don't ever want to take this stuff for granted ever again. Um, and you know, I just, I, I think that sometimes the way we think about our lives, there are healthier ways that we can kind of transition the way we frame things, you know, um, am I unfortunate that I can't do my gym routine and my car is broken down and we got to use a laundry clothesline this week? Or am I fortunate that, you know, we've got a roof over our heads and our heating and cooling systems working and we have a washing machine and a dishwasher and a beautiful home and beautiful pets and beautiful family and money to fix the car and we only need to wait a week. Like food in the fridge, you know, like there's all these other things that are going on that are working for us. And, you know, obviously like gratitude is it seems like trite advice, right, for mental health, but um, it's very real, you know, and there's a lot of research around that, too, that, like, people who journal about the things they're grateful for every morning when they've done research on, like, how it affects the brain are so much happier, so much more content with their lives, so much more mentally well, because they're looking at their pla- their life from a place of gratitude rather than lack. And again, that sounds trite, but I can tell you, you know, like I was feeling that way this week when I had to have things taken away that I had really kind of taken for granted. Do you think that every morning I was getting up saying, oh, thank you for my car? Well, sometimes I do, but like part of that's because I've had bad car trauma before. But like, you know, um, I, I like that phrase, like everything that you have in your life, be grateful for you know, if, if you wouldn't want to have it ever taken away, like, be grateful for it, because there's so many things that we don't have, like, under capitalism, I think we are trained to feel like we're not enough, you know, I don't have, like, a Kim K body, you know, like, maybe you wanted lip fillers, or you wish you had a Louis Vuitton bag, or, like, this guy wants a Mustang Ferrari space car, or whatever, you know, there's so many things that we are, like, brainwashed to want or to like that can just kind of put us on a hedonistic uh hedonic what is it hedonic treadmill basically like no matter how much more you get you're just gonna buy more and get bored with it just like a child who buys a new toy and then like throws it in the toy basket and forgets about it a week later and then wants another toy the next time they go to the store because they're bored and they don't even know what toys they have in the basket right at home and that's a really like common human phenomena and I think when we are in these meditative states, whether, especially, honestly, like Zazen, something that I like to do a lot is I will use mindfulness meditation to get myself into like a delta or a theta wave brain state. These are like the brain wavelengths of people who are more calm. And what they say about it is for manifesting, if you believe in that, or even just for like visualizing you know, say there's a girl that you have a crush on, if you're like a high school student and you want to ask a girl out and you're scared because you think your self-talk is bad, I'm a loser, I'm a nerd, I have social anxiety, I don't know how to talk to girls, I'm nervous, you know, but the best way to deprogram yourself or reprogram yourself is to get into a theta wave or an alpha wave state, usually via meditation or something like even binaurials, there's a little bit of research around that too. And then you start visualizing yourself in the most confident way, (laughs) you know, like you, just like a sports psychologist, you know, if I'm a basketball player and I want to make sure that I shoot the basket, that I shoot the goal, I would get myself into this very calm state first. And then I would visualize that. So that's kind of a whole other thing for like another day. I don't really know if I would consider creative visualization a form of meditation. I feel like it is different in the sense that manifesting what you want I don't know it feels like sucking in energy versus like accepting what is kind of feels like observing the energy like I just feel like in my mind and in like the way I categorize things and like mental health or like meditation practices these are like almost like opposite modalities like accepting what is versus trying to manipulate reality or manipulate your perception of reality or 
train your brain for a certain level of like physical or social performance, um, you know, confidence building and things like that. I hope that's not too abstract for folks. Um, I'm going to try to see like what recent research I can kind of dig up to help back up some of these claims, because I know that like psychology is, it's a very watery, uh, like science, <laughs> like almost like an art form sometimes. And like, I think people think of it a lot like snake oil when, psychologists like myself want to talk about like alternative medicine or like alternative techniques but for me I feel like it's important to validate some of the new age stuff and like some of the things out there in the spiritual community that we consider um I don't know what do we we you know like people just they think it's hogwash but like I don't like and it I feel like part of my mission on earth is to show people where it's not hogwash like I I'm all for skepticism I think being skeptical is important um especially sometimes it's dangerous right to believe in like too much woo you know people who join cults that like refuse to get their kids medical attention or like the anti-vax like movement is kind of sad to somebody like me um but in the same breath I also think it's like sad and maybe a little bit ethnocentric sometimes that we don't validate other forms of healing and other like ways of like shaping the mind another final thing I want to say about all this is that everything that I've talked about today is free <laughs> you know like well and I'm like I'm a creator like I I want to sell courses and like do this kind of stuff for a living but another thing that I want to leave people with is the fact that like this stuff doesn't cost money, and if I'm going to be a little bit conspiratorial about it, I will say, like, part of me wonders if we don't talk about the importance of meditation, of nature reconnection, of the arts, you know, of um, practices like gratitude every morning, you know, gratitude journaling, like, these things are, like, very, very powerful. Same with, like, exercise, like, there's so many things that cost us nothing that can make or break our mental health. And I, I want this station to be a place where we talk about those things because I, I think it, I don't know, they're unsung. And I, I think that there is a little bit of like a financial component to the fact that we only talk about like talk therapy and pharmaceutical medication when we talk about mental health in our society, typically, like those are the two routes. You can go to a talk therapist and then you can take pharmaceutical drugs if you have a mental illness. Those, those are like the main to go to healing modalities in our culture and they're not that effective frankly they they are you know and no shade on people where that's like your practitioner gift to the world um but you know that and that's really like a podcast for another day because I could go off for another two hours about like why some of that stuff is not all that it's cracked up to be. Um, and I'm not by any means saying don't access it if that's what you're given or that's what your insurance covers or that's what you feel you need and it's working for you. And in fact, I think everybody should try, you know, try out like therapy, regardless of whether or not you think you're having a mental health problem. Like it's healthy to kind of like preemptively um, take care of your mind and take care of your have sounding boards in life and, you know, be willing to ask yourself hard questions and be willing to break up any assumptions you might have or biases you might have or things you might be in denial about. You know, we all have a capacity for self-denial and sometimes like seeing a therapist is a really great like way to get a sounding board of like uh, somebody who's impartial in certain respects to what you or your like immediate social circle might um think about a situation some of us come from very like again this is a bit of a tangent but some of us come from very toxic like family dynamics where you might be like a victim of abuse and not even know it because everyone around you it might be like an unhealthy family system and I've met people like that who were like abused in their childhood and didn't realize it and so again like <laughs> that's why I kind of think like therapy should be very normalized where like if you hear your friend is going to a therapist, that shouldn't automatically mean, oh, I guess they're crazy. I guess, oh no. Like it shouldn't be an oh no. Like it's like, oh, hell yeah, good. Oh, you got a personal trainer? Sweet. Oh, you have a nutritionist? That's awesome. You know, I don't think, you know, you have a stylist? Cool. Like these are just specialists who have a certain level of training that can, you know, help you to kind of like 
unpack things or like get a new perspective. Um, I'm going to do a whole other podcast actually on like the pros and cons of talk therapy because there's a lot and like how to get into that if you've never experienced it, what to expect. Uh, Because I think a lot of people are afraid. That's really nothing to be afraid of. Although there are certain like extraneous circumstances where like, for example, a therapist could re-traumatize you or cause harm. And I think that's what most people are really understandably nervous about. So I do want to do another talk about that another day, just kind of like normalizing what that process is like for people, because I don't think we're going to live in a mentally well society collectively unless a preemptive, like, what do you call that? Like, like uh, preventative care, basically, for mental health is more ubiquitous, you know, more casual and... Um, I have a whole, a lot of other thoughts about, like, the legitimacy of, like, the binary pass-fail way that we tend to talk about sanity in our world, too. Most people have some kind of possible mental health diagnosis, and some people don't even really think that diagnosing with mental health health labels is the most effective way to talk about our well-being in that sense. But, again, that's that's a talk for another day. Um, Mostly, I just wanted to give you my three intros to uh, different types of meditation that you can check out and that kind of like final caveat of maybe like a bit of a teaser about things like manifesting and positive meditation, positive thinking, uh, positive psychology and sports psychology related to like visualizing the kind of person you want to be, which I think is quite different really from meditation, but it is related, I think, in terms of deliberately shaping the way your mind works and deliberately accessing and trying to like mold your own subconscious mind from a conscious place which is it's hard to do and I think it's an art form I think the subconscious mind is real and most of us don't have access to it but things like meditation they they're they can be a gateway they can be a portal to giving us a little bit more access to shift who we are and For a final thing, I'll close this podcast out with my final thought is in the spiritual community for meditation, there is a belief that when we meditate, it is actually a gift to the whole world. It is a gift to the entire universe um, from a more like transpersonal, we're all one like spiritual standpoint, if you're into that kind of stuff. Um, If you think that you're bad at meditating or like, you know, uh, you feel like it's self-indulgent or you don't have enough time, maybe that knowledge will help inspire you to start a practice because meditation is not just for you. Meditation benefits the whole world. When your mind is quiet, you are creating like a ripple effect um, in the rest of like the collective consciousness, I believe. And on a more material, mechanical a way of framing that you're going to be a kinder person to your spouse, your kids, your colleagues, like meditation will make you a better community member and um, like a more effective person in terms of like productivity and other like kind of subtle mental, subtle but important changes in your mental health come about when you have a regular practice that it, it just really, it benefits everyone around you. So it's really not just about us. Again, we live in this very individualist society and I, I love the idea that your meditation is a gift. I think that's really beautiful, especially if you feel like we don't have time or we don't want to waste time. Um, there are some who believe that meditation is like one of the most important gifts of your time that you can give back to the universe or like the sentient collective that you are a part of because you are bringing about like a deeper sense of peace or love you know (laughs) like in the in the ether and again like that sounds woo but like there there have also been studies where like people have talked about how brain waves they don't just stay in the brain um brain waves can actually have a ripple effect where you felt it if you walk into like a really stressful place where people have been fighting you can almost kind of feel that even if no one's fighting anymore if they're those people are still in the same room and there's just like this sense of agitation you're having the opposite effect on your environment when you have a more like a mind that you have trained to be calm and more present and more loving. So it's it's really truly a gift from you to your community and the people who are directly impacted by your decision making and the way that you engage with them. So 
get to meditating. There's a beautiful um, story about some folks who started a meditation like circle in a city with a really high crime rate, I think. <laughs> and the leaders of the meditation group told the police that um, crime rates would go down if they meditated because that was like the thing they were going to meditate on. And of course, people thought that was silly and impossible, but um, I think it actually worked. And I think the crime rates actually went down more than was expected and it really freaked the police force out. So I'll try to find that article of that story. Um, I think it's a real story and that's just like another beautiful analogy for, you know, what we're trying to say here that like meditation is not just like some boring thing that you're bad at that you don't have time for. Uh, I think there's like so many deeper reasons to do that. And, and also, you know, it's just good for your mental health and it'll help you have like a better day and a better week. So thank you so much for being here with this, um, message today and I look forward to the next one. Have a great one. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe if this has helped you out and we'll see you later. Take care.